right, ASP here with uh, call sign tinfoil, man, uh, tinfoil hat man. So this is all USMC or Marine Corps gear from um, World War One, or actually pre World War One to World War One. So let's take it away. What do you have here? What you see in front of you is a collection of Marine Corps equipment, and right here is pre World War One. This is what the Marine Corps was using in like 1910, 1914 time frame. Yeah. When they went into Mexico, this is the equipment they were using, Haiti, Central America. Um, during that time frame, the Marine Corps was also known as the private army of the State Department because at that time, if there was a problem somewhere in the world, you could not send in the U.S. Army without a declaration of war. Okay. The president could send in the Marine Corps for 30 days without anything from Congress. So that allowed them to send the Marines into different hot spots to restore order, protect American interests, and then leave without having to send them in the regular army. This also gave the Marine Corps valuable combat experience and small unit training, where they were fighting guerrillas or people who were upset with the local government. So they would actually get shot at periodically. Um, this equipment is a step up from what they had used to wear, yeah. which was more of an earlier web pattern where the bullets were actually housed outside of little pockets. This is the first evolution you see of pockets that actually contained the rounds. The pockets had little eagle globe and anchor snaps. They were very artistic in a way that it wasn't a very practical, but it looked nice. It was very military. Plane snaps would eventually come into play because of economics and ease yeah. of production. Some of the equipment, in especially the mess gear, was held over from Spanish-American War. It's very similar. Okay. Cups, the mess kits are very similar. So, uh, as the war progresses, the mess kits get a little deeper, a little bit bigger, but for the most part, it's almost identical. Fork, okay. knife, and spoon is just the same old fork, knife, and spoon. The round canteen, though, you see hanging on the side of the mannequin, is very similar to what was issued in the American Civil War. All it is is a metal canteen housed inside a cloth cover. The regular canteen that's more similar that people recognize from movies that you're holding in your hand, that's the 1910 canteen. The difference was now, instead of one giant round canteen, it would be a canteen, the cup would actually fit over the canteen, and all of that would go into a pouch that would hang on the belt. So, at this point, you had one large canteen on your belt, and the cup actually had to hang off the back of the backpack. Now, the cup and canteen okay. would be housed together. Also, one thing at the bar end that we had looked at originally, the signal flags. At okay. this time, there are no radios. The only way to send messages back and forth were either hand write a note and have somebody run it, a i.e. a runner, yeah, a messenger, yeah, or a runner, signal yeah. flags. These signal flags, you could flag large distances, or especially for the Marines, from shore to ship. Mm -hmm. During the Spanish-American War, Sergeant Quick is actually at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, they're being attacked by a larger Spanish force. He gets in front of Spanish fire and puts himself in danger, but to stand up out in the open and signal uh, shore bombardment to the mm -hmm. warships off the, off the coast. He actually wins the Congressional Medal of Honor for that. All right, what's in this glass display? The glass display, are these are all original pouches, be it the original belt and original pouches for the new type of canteen plus the older canteen. The other thing you'll see in here is a 1901 revolver. That was the standard sidearm for all armed forces, Army, Marine, Navy, at the turn of the last century. It's a 38 caliber revolver and is basically a cowboy gun. It's as close to the gun wired or used as you can get. Okay. The problem with it, it really does not have a lot of knockdown power. Of course. And during this time, they were running into Central America where some of the uh, natives and rebels were cooked up on uh, drugs. cocaine and yeah. drugs. And, that, and it just did not have the knockdown power to knock them down. The result of that, and going back to the government saying we need a better pistol, will eventually turn into the M1911 45 caliber pistol that is actually still used in the military today. Mm -hmm. Here, that bat large pack that's on the back of that mannequin was actually called a blanket bag. And the reason it was a blanket bag was because it would fit a blanket. And all your extra stuff would also go in there around it. 
you could fit your shoes, your shirt, your toiletries, your shaving gear, everything went in, it opened up like a regular backpack, and it had a large haversack that connected to the belt at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Inside that bag would be bags for toiletries, food, shaving gear, everything would be in there, and the blanket, dust that it's named after. Mm -hmm. The other thing that could be in there is a raincoat or a poncho, and your tent pieces. The way the tent was issued, you received a shelter quarter, which was 25% of a tent. Okay. You got five stakes, one guideline, and one folding tent pole. To put up a half-decent tent, you needed two people. Okay. Theoretically, you could put four together and have four people sleeping in what a pup tent is. Okay. Most, 90% of the time, it was just two men in a tent, but because it was only a quarter, that meant one half of the tent was open to the elements. Okay. The other thing you see over there is a collapsible ring cap. That is a rubberized hat that would be worn with the raincoat or poncho, especially while on guard duty. It was very comfortable, and it also collapsed up real nice and would travel well in the bottom of that pack. Oh, yeah. When the Marines go into World War I itself, though, they've changed pack systems and are now wearing the 1910 pack, very similar to what the U.S. Army wore. It is a different pack system in that it's not a standard backpack as it is more of a haversack yeah. that folds into multiple pieces to make the pack element. Inside of that would be everything you would need from change of underwear to your shaving gear, letters from home, food, etc. Now, what you see here in front of you is Are now the toiletries? Shaving, toiletries and shaving okay. gear, collapsible wash basin, to towels, razors. Now, before World War I, a lot of armies allowed their men to wear beards, mustaches, things of this nature. When chemical gas came into play, uh -oh. and the use of uh, gas masks, to have a good proper seal, you have you to have be clean to, shaven. Yeah, be clean Thus, shaven. most armies in the world became clean shaven the very next day, because now they needed to shave every day in case they needed to put their gas masks on. Due to gas attacks. Exactly. The other thing you'll see here is a sewing kit. Every soldier had a sewing kit, because while you're out in the war, mommy is not there to sew your pants or put buttons back on for you. you you need to do it yourself, and your sergeant is not going to do it for you. The other thing now you had was a uh, meat can pouch your mess kit would go into. You had a fork, a knife, a spoon, mm -hmm. and can opener. With, again, oh, wow. the advent of chemical gas, food was now put into metal cans. It had been put into cans prior to that for yeah. more preservation purposes. But you don't want to have the gas. You don't want to have the gas to contaminate the food. And, exactly. Yeah. So now most of your food was going to be in some type of metal can. You needed to be able to get into it. Trench lighter would also be used for men who wanted to smoke cigarettes when they were allowed oh, to smoke cigarettes that's outside. It's oh. so cool. And this would actually go up like this. So when you lit it, it would hide the flame, so you didn't give away your position, yeah, okay. and the wind wouldn't blow out the flame on you. Well, that's that's an innovative of design. Again, another example of the canteen, the new canteen that was being used. Now, 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 from what I'm seeing from the canteen that I saw and this, yes. one second. this has the seams. This yes. has been welded together. That is the later version of the canteen as opposed to the early canteens which were seamless. Yeah. The original canteens were actually blown in a way, made in a way that was almost similar as blowing glass. Uh -huh. So if there were no seams to it, it was a solid construction. Yeah. The Army and the Marine Corps realized we can make these things ourselves and for a lot cheaper if we just did it and did it with a seam. Yeah. And again, there's a perfect example of how it all fits in the cup. And over here, you'll see in the cup and in the pouch. Yep. Now, out here also, I have some examples. Sometimes the French made stuff for us also. This one was made by the French in 1918. It's to American specifications, but it's made of steel. Okay. Most of the American canteens were made out of aluminum, yeah. so it's a little heavier than a normal mess kit, but in a pinch, and due to supply reasons, yeah. it was happily accepted. The other thing you'll see here, I have a French canteen, which is a little larger. Yeah. I have a German canteen here also, and this is actually a cavalry canteen that had been, the regular normal hanger has been removed, and they put a shoulder strap on it from a pair of binoculars to make it a more easy, accessible, over-the-shoulder canteen. Yeah. The reason there is multiple canteens here, 
one of the biggest problems during the war was yes. lack of water at the front line. Yeah, dehydration. Absolutely. Yeah. So for troops to have an extra source of water, mm -hmm. opposed to the one canteen they had, they have guys would cook. carry yeah. extras. Yeah. Now, everything you see here is what would be inside that haversack pack on that mannequin's back. So this guy here. This guy there. What you see, that's that pack when it's all closed up. This is that pack when it's all blown out with everything in it. One of the that's reasons, a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. But yeah. in here you need a change of underwear, socks, t-shirts, winter socks, maybe a pair of pants. If it's the winter, or gloves, glove, a sweater vest, and extra food. Every soldier, when they went up to the front line, had two cans of bread tins, yeah. like crackers, hardtack. Yeah. An emergency ration that they weren't supposed to go into unless it was an emergency. Yeah. Usually got eaten. And they had condiment can and their meat can. Now this again was a typical can and this one, as opposed to a can of food you may get, allowed you to put sausage or fruit or something else that was fresh, seal it in metal, in case you're in a gas attack now, it's safe, it's not going to get hurt. Okay. Now, something interesting here. Yes. All this is Marines, but what is this? U.S. Army. You got to remember, the Army was the main source of supply during the war. So everything that came in was pretty much designed for the U.S. Army. General Pershing refused to get a separate source of supply for the Marines, so once the Marines showed up, everything after that came from the U.S. Army and was U.S. Army issued. Oh, wow. even, even down to the uniforms. I bet the Marines were pissed off with that. They were not happy about that, especially as their uniform during war. Your uniforms are going to get ripped. They're Get torn. Oh, yeah. oh, you're yeah. in a gas attack, your uniform now needs to be taken away from you and destroyed, you're going to get issued a new one. When that happened, they were given U.S. Army uniforms. Now, needless to say, the Marines were not real happy about wearing U.S. Army uniforms, so what they did is they cut off the buttons off their old uniforms and, and sewed, sewed them, them on, on to the yeah. Army uniforms, much to the chagrin of the U.S. Army. Here is an example of some of the different belts, and you can see the evolution of some of the belts from the original ones from that the they original. wore down to the lifted dot snaps, yeah. which were more economic and more practical. Yeah, because with these, these the, the buttons tend to come off after so many use. Absolutely. And I mean, it's 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 not going to be practical if you're going to keep making this, and this is going to be more expensive. Whereas this, faster. Easy to use, cheap, economical. Absolutely. Now, the other thing you'll see here are the boots and the leggings. Now, the leggings, this is what everyone wore at the beginning of the war. And the reason they had leggings were, back in the time, gentlemen wore spats. It gave a very neat appearance. Mm -hmm. It made you look nice. Also, if you were in the woods or moving through a briar patch, it protected the bottom of your pants from being ripped up. Yeah. Um, it, it helped prolong the life of your uniform. Again, in France, during the war, in trenches, this wasn't very practical, so they developed puttees. Yeah, basically, yeah. a long piece of wool that just wrapped up around the leg, yep. kept the water and the muck and everything out of the top of your boots, and again, if you're in a gas attack, this is just a long piece of cloth, it's very cheap, very easy to replace, as opposed to a heavy canvas leg with lots of brass and everything else yeah. on it. The shoes, hobnailed, and heel plated. The concept behind that is you would have to wear through these nails and the heel plate before you start to actually wear through the leather sole on the shoe. Ah. Back then, most troops walked everywhere they went, and the concept behind it wasn't to basically step on the enemy or do anything or you know look mean. It was to prolong the life of the shoe. Needless to say, it made it very uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. No Dr. Scholl's back then. No, no. First right. aid kits at the time, <laughs> okay. at least that the general troop with in regular infantrymen had, was a little pouch that they wore on their front, and in there was one bandage. Just enough to stop a bleeding. A bleeding. You got a gunshot wound. Basically, not even you. Your friend got a gunshot wound. Yeah. You could rip this open again, sealed in metal, so it's safe from chemical gas. Yep. You could put the bandage on and hopefully get him back to a medic before he bled to death. When the troops went into the combat, they would wear their gas masks on their chest. The reason being, you could reach down, it's right here, you pull it up, you put it on your face. Yeah. You also had an extra bandolier of ammo on top of the ammo that was already in your belt, inside yeah, your little pouches. Yep. And this here is an actual, this is a magazine bag for a show show machine gun. Really? Yes. What would happen is, when the troops were going up, the BAR or the show show was a very important piece of their equipment because that was your light move ahead machine gun. Yeah. Everybody carried extra ammo. So they would hand out these bags with extra magazines and clips in it 
so that you could support the machine gun. You didn't run out of ammo for the machine gun. Also, when the bag was empty, troops would sometimes keep onto them, throw extra ammo for themselves yep. in there, grenades, maybe an apple, mm -hmm. something else in there that they could bring along. This is actually the birth of the GP bag that was very popular in World War II. Okay. Binoculars, self-explanatory, see the enemy, try to figure out where they are. This is a grenade bag, one of the first grenade bags issued out to U.S. troops. And again, they'd be full of grenades. Most of the time they were issued in pairs and your grenadier would wear them. Okay. And he would throw them into trenches as you did trench raids. The helmet, again, birth of World War I, designed for protect your head from shrapnel and things flying through the air. Yeah. Not so much a bullet. A bullet will go right through that. It's yeah. more of a, things exploding and rocks and things flying through the air. That was the main design of the helmet, mm -hmm. was to protect you from flying debris. With the gas mask on, as you can see, the helmet sits down, and this one has a canvas. This is a sandbag that's been cut into a uh, helmet cover. Most of the trenches had sandbag cut on top of them. Yeah. So the idea was if I put a sandbag on my helmet and it just happens to pop up above the trench, the enemy on the other side may not recognize that it's my helmet, think it's just one of the sandbags Back and not you. blow my head off, because as I said, a bullet will go right through this. More concealment. Exactly. The gas mask itself, though, was a rubber-lined mask with a nose clip that clipped over your nose and a tube that would go into your mouth. Oh, jeez. There'd be a bladder here oh, that's geez. no longer there and a rubber hose that went into a can that was charcoal-lined. As you can see, you had little eye lenses and this would fit over your head. And you would have to breathe through this. I bet that was uncomfortable. It was wear. uncomfortable, and considering most of your fighting, heavy fighting, it happened in between the months of April, May through the summer, it was hot. You're wearing a wool uniform. It's summer. You're wearing a metal pot on your head. All your combat equipment, you're running through a field, and now you're wearing this and trying to breathe. It's like putting a gas, uh, car, uh, uh, a shop right bag right on top of your head and trying to yes. run around. After the war, they interviewed a vet and they asked him what was it like to wear a gas mask in combat. He said, go outside, put a frying pan on your head, put a bag over your head, put a clothespin on your nose, and breathe through a sock. Uh, That'll give you an idea. And he goes, and then run around for 10 minutes. That'll give you an idea of what it was like. Oh, jeez. Now, because of this and being in a gas environment, if you were in a gas environment, you couldn't take this off. Yeah. It also meant you could not drink water. Oh, dehydration. Dehydration yeah. was a major problem. The other problem was, as I said, you wore it on your chest in a combat-ready position. Things are exploding around you. There's shrapnel, bullets flying oh, through the geez. air. If ha a stray piece happened to hit you, maybe it didn't hurt or kill you, but it may have damaged your mask. And then gas attack comes in. You're kind of SOL because then your gas mask is then compromised and you're going to be basically gassed to death. Absolutely. Or at least if you don't die, you're going to be very injured. So the German mask was sometimes picked up as a spare and carried on a back or, you know, because again, it had a little can. They throw it over the shoulder, bring it along with them. Not everybody did it, some of them did. But the other reason it was done too was because the German mask, unlike the American mask, had a filter on it that would screw off. It was very easy to change the filter on this. The American mask, since it was one piece, after so many hours in a gas environment, you had to turn in the whole mask and you were given a new whole mask back. This, you could keep and get an extra canister and it was good as long as you kept changing these filters okay. or as long as it didn't get damaged. So with these masks, one of the things that was also was, this mask was never designed originally as a combat mask. It was taken from coal miners' masks. Okay. So it's basically a civilian, a civilian idea, a civilian use that was put into press in the combat service and they just went with that basic design. Yeah. Thus, the one piece construction. For a coal miner, it's fine. You don't yeah. have to worry about certain things like things exploding around you or people cutting your hose. It would work. Or bullets flying at you. Exactly. Yeah. The German mask was designed as combat mask. Their mask was chemical impregnated leather. Okay. No extra hose hanging off and why they developed a canister that could spin on and spin off. This was designed, as I said, as a combat mask. 
not a civilian, hey, we're going to borrow this from a civilian user and press it into combat service. And this type of idea is still even prevalent today. Absolutely. This is the, this is the granddaddy of all the gas masks you see out there today in any branch of service. A mask that goes over your head with a spin-out uh, canister. Now, I have the German helmet here more as a just an example of what the Germans wore versus the British and the Americans. So you can see the different type of helmet. Now, this helmet would sit on your head a lot better, and as you can see, it protects the ears and the lower back of the neck a lot better. The only problem was it was heavier, and because it dropped down, you lost some sound and hearing. But it protected the back of the neck very well, and if you look at it, it is very similar to the helmet that even the U.S. forces wear today because yeah. of the better overall head and neck protection. Yep. German bayonets, as opposed to the American bayonets. Oh, look at those serrations. This is oh, a yeah. pioneer's bayonet. They're engineers. And that the serrations are there, not to look mean, but to actually use to cut down small trees. Oh, okay. All right. Now, when the war starts, shovels, picks, axes like that weren't an individual item. Today, every soldier gets a shovel, a collapsible shovel. Yeah. Back then, maybe one guy in 20 had a shovel. Nobody had shovels. When the Marines go into Bellow Wood, all the way at the end, you'll see his backpack doesn't have a shovel on it. All he has is his meat can pouch where his mess kit was. Well, all of a sudden they get in there and they realize they're going to have to dig fortifications. They started to dig their foxholes with their mess covers. Uh -oh. The covers from their mess kit is what they used to dig holes. After the war, veterans and survivors were interviewed and some of them said, you'll be amazed at how quickly and how good of a hole you can actually dig when German artillery is landing all around you. Uh -huh. But immediately after that, they realized we needed to get shovels for everyone. Yeah. And by the end of the war, there were more shovels and picks and axes in with the troops than if they had to dig holes, trenches, things to hide in, okay. they could do so. And this is an example right over this here. This is an example of the shovel that was used all the way up through World War II. T-handle, individual shovel. Okay. The other item is a pick Maddox. This would actually come apart and it basically makes a pick. So you can dig between the shovel and the picks, dig yourselves a larger fortification. Now, and what is this? This is a trench periscope. It was small enough that it would clip on a belt. It had a stick that you could prop it into the ground. And then what you could do is you would look through one end and you could look up and see through the top over the trench oh, without nice. exposing yourself to enemy fire. Oh. Because you wanted to see, make sure one, you weren't going to pop your head over the trench because you would get it shot off. Because yeah. there were guys that were positioned on both sides, Allied and German, to look for people putting their heads up over the trench. Yeah. So, but you also, if you weren't looking over the trench, you wanted to make sure they weren't sneaking up on you. Oh, yeah. And that's how you would do it. Another way was a little item that you would keep in your pocket and you would take it off. You could put it on the tip of a bayonet, open the little door if it wants to open, and you had a mirror again. And nice. you could put it up over a trench, and you could look to see what was going on without, again, putting your head up over the trench. Yep, without it being exposed. Without it being exposed. Yep. Another item that came out of the trenches was a gas alarm. If there was a chemical gas attack, you wanted to let everybody know this was happening because everyone needed to put their gas masks yeah. on. Two ways of doing this were the blowing of whistles, and banging of metal cans. Bang two metal items together. Make a, make a loud noise so that people know, or this alarm. You would spin that, these things would start to everyone realize, oh my god, there's a gas attack, put on your gas masks. You know what's funny? This is still used because for as um, for parties. Right. Yeah. The other thing that was issued out too were bolo knives. Bolo knife originally was an engineer item. Part of it was to chop down small branches so you could help build fortifications. Yep. Medics and corpsmen would also be issued these, chop off limbs. Uh, oh, jeez. Uh, if you had an arm or a leg that was just barely hanging on, they uh, would use this to hack through it the rest of the way uh, and then dress you and send you back to the hospital behind the lines. Terrible. Trench knives were also used. Again, the fighting in the trenches was very brutal almost primitive, um, almost medieval. There are accounts of 
soldiers on both sides using bats with nails in them, mm. maces, weapons that hadn't been used since knights in armor ran around, yeah. were used to bludgeon each other to death in the trenches. Trench knives were another example. Brass knuckles, punch in the face, stab the enemy. Another trench knife, the earlier version, pig more stickers. of a pig sticker. Yeah, yeah. Again, big metal around the knuckles to punch and break the guy's jaw and then stab him with the pig sticker. The problem with a pig sticker though, as opposed to a regular knife, the pig sticker, because of the way it is, when you stick someone, you pull it out, the wound tends to close up behind you and the enemy bleeds to death internally. Uh, Very brutal. Now what's here? All right, now we have examples of the rifles that were used during the war. The top rifle is the 03 Springfield. That was used by both the U.S. Marines and the Army, but they, they were very, that was a rifle everyone had at the beginning of the war. Well, because of the Army and the Marines exploded as far as manpower and needs, there were more men than there were available rifles. Yeah. So a stopgap measure was the M17 Enfield rifle. Most Army units actually had this rifle during the war as opposed to the Springfield rifle. The only Marines that tended to have this rifle were training in the United States. If you were inside the United States, you had one of these rifles because all of these went to France. This is an example of what the bullet would look like. That is an 306 round that would be fired in either of these rifles. Yeah. Same bullet for both rifles. The bayonets that both rifles would mount. Now what's neat is the combat shotgun. Oh, this yeah. shotgun is the 1897 Winchester shotgun. The difference is it is hammered. As opposed to a modern pump shotgun, when you would actually cock this, this hammer would come back. And then when you pulled the trigger, the hammer would go forward. Yeah. Remember, you're talking 1897 technology. But what's neat about it is it actually bayonet. took a bayonet. So now you had a pump shotgun with a bayonet oh, on yeah. it. Just looks really, really neat. Now the ways to carry the ammo, they would put the shells in bags like this. Yes. Or these are actually belts left over from the Spanish-American War, but they made great bandoliers. Oh yeah. This was seen a lot on ship. Okay. This a lot in the field. Because there really wasn't a, a belt designed specifically for shotgun ammo. Yeah. So needs pressed. Over here, as we talked earlier about the pistol, this was the sidearm used by American forces in World War I. It is the M1911 45 caliber pistol. It took a magazine in the bottom and held seven 45 caliber rounds. Unlike the earlier pistol, which was an upgun, with basically a cowboy gun, this was a legit combat sidearm. This 45 caliber pistol would knock down anyone who it would sh who was shot by it. Yeah. This, this had stopping power, unlike that other pistol. The other pistol would take, on average, two to three rounds to kill a person. This one round would do the job. Yeah. This is an example of map from the period. Verdun. Huh. But as you can see, the maps are very, they were all done by hand. No such thing as uh, modern day printing technology. Well, they did have printing technology and well, they would be done at certain yeah. points, but it was very hard to do maps. Um, maps could be done. But it would take time. It would take time. Now what's here? Now what we have here, the war has come to an end. The Marines are now in occupation duty inside Germany. Um, with that, they were finally received their own source of supply again, because now the war oh, yeah. is over, they can get their uniforms. So the first thing the Marines did would take off the Army uniforms and put back on their Marine uniforms. Now earlier on I had made a comment about the Marines didn't want to wear collar discs. So, but when they got into occupation duty, they realized they didn't actually look that bad. And, you know, the German girls kind of liked them. So they put them on. Again, did not make the officers in the Army happy at all. Because they had wanted the Marines to wear them all along, and now they were doing it after the war. Um, they also put on their ribbons and their decorations, French medal, their sharpshooter badge, and the French Forger. French Forger was an award issued to the Marines, the 5th and 6th Regiment, and an Army unit, I believe, for what they had done at Belleau Woods, Mont Blanc, and some of the other battles. It was a recognition from the French, hey, we appreciate everything you did for us. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, to this day, worn by the Marines 5th and 6th Regiment, but only if you're in the regiment. 
if you leave those regiment, you have to take it off because it's not a personal award, it's an award that belongs to the unit. Okay. Also, if you'll notice, there is also a patch on the sleeve. It's a red diamond. That is for 1st Battalion, 6th Marines. 1st Battalion, 5th Marines was the same red, yeah. but it was a square instead of a diamond. Okay. Four days or three days after the war finally ended, an order was approved that would give this level of recognition to the Marine Brigade. Red, blue, and yellow were the three colors used. Yes. Squares and diamonds, red, depending upon which regiment you yeah. were. They put it on their uniforms and they painted it on their helmets while they were in occupation duty in Germany. When they left Germany, it all came off. Okay. It was only done while they were in Germany on occupation duty. The other thing the Marines were able to get was now they were able to get side caps also finally done in the correct Marine color as opposed to the Army ones they had been wearing while they were in France mm -hmm. prior while the war was happening. Here is also a collection of some of the magazines or pamphlets that were handed out to troops, be it things that were given to them by the USO and Red Cross, to actual manuals on how to speak French and German, foot care. Oh, yeah. French foot was a big problem during the war. Got to protect um, your feet. And then also signal flags that you saw earlier. Yeah. Range book that was probably given to the troops while they were in boot camp. And another book. You're on a long ship trip over to France, how to abandon ship, and uh, there is everything you need to know, and hopefully you did not need to use it. Yeah. U-boats were a problem in World War I just as much as they were in World War II. These are actually recruiting manuals. While well, you know, war is over, they wanted some of the troops to re-enlist, and they were also looking for new people to join the military after the war was over. A lot of guys just decided they were going home. The item here in the frame, you'll see, is a recognition award that was sent to the Marines after the war was over. The French government was so impressed and so happy with how the Marines had performed during the war that they actually had these made up individually for all the sold, all the Marines that had served in France. If you were a Marine and had served in France, that Fourage that I had mentioned earlier yeah. was actually a personal award for you. You could wear it no matter where you were in the Marine Corps. It's after all those guys were gone that the units now just wear it as a, as a remembrance mm -hmm. and what the unit had done. But if you had this citation, that was yours. You earned it. And in each, each one of these was done differently because it explained what that individual had done. Most of the time when you find these, they're rolled up in a cardboard tube that they were sent to the Marines in after the war in the 20s. This one, whoever received it, liked it so much that they went through all the effort to actually have it framed. That's amazing. And then the last item you'll see here is a set of marine dress blues. Now, prior to the war, there would have been no collar discs. It was just a straight blue collar, similar to how the straight collar was on the first mannequin that you store down at the end. Yep. But, as I had said, after the war, the Marines started to wear these collar discs, and these would actually eventually lose the disc itself and just become the EGA that everyone knows on the dress blues today. Yeah. Now this is a man who had come home from France already, and the medals he's actually wearing are the Federal Medal. This was the medal that was issued out to everybody, and depending upon what you did in the war, these bit little tags would change. This is actually a state award. Each state also issued a medal to anybody that had been in the Army, the Navy, or the Marines for their recognition and victory of World War I, and some local municipalities also issued out a oh, medal. Wow. So you will receive a medal from the government, a medal from the state, and a medal from your hometown. To a lot of guys, these medals were the most important thing they had because it was recognition from home. That's amazing. And that's basically it. And that's basically it. Well, thank you for your time, tinfoil hat man. <laughs> I really do appreciate it. Amazing display, amazing, a lot of amazing information of uh, Marine Corps history. Thank you so much. Thank you.